Thank you, Simon. So um, good afternoon, everybody, um, and welcome to the um, Museum Association members meeting for Scotland. My name is Michael Turwey. I'm your host um, this afternoon, and I'm a trustee of the Museum Association. Um, I'm going to kind of just kick off with a few kind of notices. Um, first of all, this is the third of the Museum Association Zoom members meetings. Um, there's much to recommend it in that we don't have to travel to be together, um, although Bear with us, please, because some of the technology is still relatively new and we're kind of working out what works and, and what doesn't work. Um, so a couple of, couple of notices first. The next Coronavirus Conversations webinar um, will be on, um, which was on the 23rd of July on dismantling racism in museums. Um, sorry, this is probably a, a, a sort of on the past time. Could you kind of confirm for me, because I've got down here all these notes um, that it's on the 23rd of July, but of course we are now in September. So that's probably um, past now. Sorry, 23rd of September, that's correct. So you can sign up for that on the 23rd of September um, on the MA website. Um, the Coronavirus Conversations and MA members meetings are free to all individual members, corporate members, um, and those that um, work in institutions that are, are members. Um, so for today, all attendees um, will have been sent kind of joining instructions. So a few bits and pieces, you will be automatically muted, which is a very strange kind of experience. Um, but if you've not been automatically muted, please mute yourselves. It just makes it easier for everybody to hear. Um, we do have both the chat function and the Q&A function running for this meeting. So the chat function is for sharing ideas, thoughts, web links, just saying hi. Um, the Q&A function should be used to ask questions of speakers um, specifically. So if you kind of keep your, um, your comments and, and thoughts to the chat channel and the Q&A for, um, for any questions. Um, there is the option of being anonymous if you want to ask questions, um, but it would be also great to say um, who you are if you, if you don't mind telling that. Um, you can, of course, leave and rejoin the meeting at any time for whatever reason you may choose to leave the meeting um, and rejoin, that's not a problem. Um, and just to kind of, a quick um, note is we are, as you can see on the top left hand side of your screen, we are recording um, the session today. Um, Twitter hashtag for today, hashtag MA Scotland. So um, if you've got even more things you want to share with the wider community and not through the chat channel, then please do um, take to Twitter to kind of do that. Um, hello, Jilly, go to you. <laughs> um, it's lovely to kind of, although I can't see um, anybody, obviously, I, I'm very I'm happy to see so many names of familiar people, even though I can't say familiar faces, because I can't see your faces. Um, so first of all, just to kind of introduce me, I'm, I'm uh, Michael Turwey. I've worked in museums for about 20 or so years. Um, I'm currently the Head of Heritage Services at the National Trust for Scotland, which means I have a kind of broad ranging remit across collections and curatorial work but also some of the other um, sort of aspects of the heritage that we manage in, in the trust things like archaeology um, seabirds nature and so on and so forth but my background is very much in um, museums I've worked in local authority museums I've worked in national museums um, and I'm from Fife originally so it's a great um, pleasure for me to be back in, in Scotland and a pleasure to be hosting this kind of meeting um, NTS at the moment, as with so many organisations in the sector, um, is going through a bit of a tough time. Um, we, um, like I said, we're not unusual in kind of doing that. A lot of people in this room will be kind of engaged in um, difficult decision making and cuts making uh, at the moment. Um, and as more you know, likely as we sort of work our way through the consequences of the coronavirus pandemic, we'd like to be more of those kind of consequences working their way through, through museums. Um, and as well as that, there's, unlike, as we've noticed um, today, with kind of the further implementation of kind of restrictions on kind of movement and socialising, um, ongoing uncertainty as well for um, sort of all of us working in the sector and meaning flexibility and improvisation being the, the kind of the order of the day. Um, I just wanted to really say on that sort of all of those kind of matters, the Museum Association is your association. Um, we're here to kind of support you in whatever you need um, and to keep on top of those kind of changes to kind of bring out new guidance to respond to the kind of things that are part of your working lives as they kind of change and develop over the, over the coming months. Um, so what some of what you're going to hear today has been a little bit about the support that's available from um, the MA for, for museums. Um, but also, um, I'm very pleased that we're going to be talking as well about 
sort of professional development support as well that's available to you as individuals and museum professionals um, through this, this difficult time. Um, do tell us, I mean, keep communicating with us, communicate with your, your reps, with us as kind of trustees, with the members of staff in the Museum Association. Um, tell us what you need as well, and we can always kind of try and respond to that as best we can and bring forward um, programs and support accordingly. Um, so I'm going to shut up now um, and hand over to Maggie Appleton, who is the chair of the Museum Association. Maggie, are you there? Hello, Maggie, are you with us? Okay, a little bit of a kind of, um, oh, yes, there we are. The delights of technology. Thank you so much, Michael, for that warm introduction. And it's lovely to see uh, you and to be here virtually with colleagues in Scotland. Um, I was just reflecting that our last members meeting in Scotland was almost exactly a year ago. It's actually a year and five and five days ago. And blimey, what a difference a year or eight months even makes. Um, we were talking then about museums change lives, the difference museums uh, make, and we're reflecting on some fabulous examples from Scotland in the beautiful Perth Museum and Art Gallery. We're distanced today, um, but a big thank you to Museums Association colleagues, to Sam Stevens and to Sharon and all the team for virtually bringing us together. Um, they've asked me, as you can see, to reflect a little bit on uh, challenges and opportunities. Uh, but just as we were about to start, I glanced over my shoulder and realised behind me um, are three beautiful paintings that I ought to mention um, to you. They are, I'm going to just move to the side. Some of you may actually recognise them because they're um, works by Tom McKendrick called Burning and they're dedicated to the generation of people that were affected by the climate Clyde Bank Blitz. And as many of you will know, I'm sure as a result of uh, Luftwaffe air raids in on, over two nights in March 1941, the town was largely destroyed and it suffered um, the worst destruction and civilian loss in Scotland during the whole of the Second World War. 1,200 people um, died, 1,000 people were seriously injured, many more uh, were injured too, and 35,000 people were made homeless. I think eight houses survived uh, in the whole town um, out of 12,000, so it was a massive, massive impact. Um, but they are beautiful works, and I uh, thought how appropriate that I wanted to share them with you. Um, Tom McKendrick was born and brought up in Clyde Bank. Um, and those visions of the scarred and charred um, remains and reminders of the town were really with him as he grew up. So they're not contemporary uh, works, but the ones that really affected him and a generation of people. And he painted them as really a tribute to the community. And just, you know, reflecting on that, how relevant and appropriate these works of art are in terms of how our collections um, are, are reminders to us and move us and often the product of, of uh, really um, very traumatic uh, experiences and joyful ones, of course at times. Um, I tried for uh, certainly the first few months at least to resist the comparisons between COVID and wartime, but of course there are generational and long-term impacts that draw clear parallels um, for that. Um, but I was asked to reflect a little on the opportunities and challenges. And again, I am um, very aware that they're often uh, interwoven and often uh, what we can talk about as an opportunity is also a massive, um, a massive uh, challenge for us. Um, and in, in terms of some of those, starting with the challenges, I'm 
really conscious of the whole health agenda at the moment, both organisational and personal um, health. And organisational um, health, as Michael mentioned, so many of our organisations are going through what can only dis be described as um, trauma. And it isn't even about the strongest and fittest surviving in this bizarre time, although those clearly with the deepest pockets have, pockets have built some resilience. Um, but in many ways, those self-reliant ones, our colleagues in museums that we were lauding as the ones who were um, self-reliant and resilient because they weren't um, reliant on the swings and arrows of fortune in the public sector were the ones that we often sort of turn to as great examples. And of course, they were the first to be hit when we had to close our museums, mainly in March, all of us. Um, although, of course, they were the first to be hit, but I'm also terribly, terribly conscious of any museums funded by the public sector who were already um, in turmoil as well and there is more of that we know to come over one two five years and uh, you know potentially that generational impact too and alongside that um, organizational health issue and that affects us personally of course but those the health of our people during lockdown and, reop and reopening again is a huge issue and i'm very aware of the health inequalities there too um, Certainly um, for us at the Royal Air Force Museum, a challenge that, that um, was an opportunity in some way was how as a team we all interacted together during lockdown and we soon all got working from teams and interacted together whatever our roles and some great conversations and support were happening both on teams but, but organising trees uh, via the telephone to call colleagues and volunteers and there was a real virtual putting our arms around each other and I know that was true in a lot of organisations that the reporting back is that people did care for each other and step up and there was a real positive there of working across teams and um, and across different disciplines, front of house, back of house as well. You know, clearly there was a difficulty there with some organisations furloughing, but there was a lot of thought and attention and care um, given by many. Um, and, you know, again, that working from home challenge became an opportunity. And we've seen a silver lining of positivity there of somewhere that certainly our organisation wouldn't have got to within at least three years in that thinking differently about working from home that we've all talked about, flexible working that's got environmental benefits, um, cost benefits and time benefits to all of us for our commute that may be spent with our families or potentially um, additional work time. I'm not advocating that clearly. Um, but that became a positivity as well. But, you know, again, the pendulum swinging to the worry, of course, there is an inequality there because those of us who were working from home, there is a difference at work from home if you've got beautiful space to work in, um, a family that you get on with, cats possibly, um, but there's an, an equality, inequality there. Certainly many of my colleagues are working from, you know, from cramped conditions, potentially a city, there's not nearly the same opportunity enjoyed for some as others. And then of course there's also a large percentage of our staff now that we're reopening and even during the close period too that have to be on site so our visitor experience colleagues our front of house colleagues and many of our commercial colleagues that have to be at home so our new way of working that we're saying great we can be more flexible when we have those conversations i'm always mindful that some of my colleagues don't have that choice they have to be here um, it, uh, during the day here and you know putting this uh, themselves in a position of risk because of uh, we're out there talking to colleagues so again there's an inequality inherent in all of this um, with colleagues and of course it's it's so often those that have um, less um, or less well-paid colleagues that are at a disadvantage here and I think it's really important that we're all um, really aware of that. Um, at the RF Museum, our reopening, we had, although of course fewer people coming through the doors, we needed more staff and said everyone back of house and front of house but back of house colleagues 
also had to support front of house and we had a rotor with everyone who was able to and thoughtfully done because of course anxiety about coming back and that working together again really helped that back and how back of house and front of house gelling together understanding each other and my concern and determination actually is we don't lose that camaraderie that's been making the best of a difficult situation to dissipate because of those inequalities potentially of the new flexible working opportunity so i guess you know that's a a, a, a first one that i'm certainly very conscious about and the issue of the health of all our people is again um, a challenge and a concern um i was uh, here in the museum in the galleries on sunday um and talking to one of my brilliant v uh, visitor experience colleagues and we had a little discussion about maintenance and she had a little oh do you know what things do take too long to get them we had that conversation that i'm sure you all recognize and she found me an hour later because we were covering the same part of the gallery together and apologized for being negative because i you know when i'm talking to staff it's always like how do we find you know if there's an issue how do we make find a solution together and she apologized to me <laughs> for being negative and her eyes were full of tears and um she hasn't been affected personally in terms of her family losing family but most of her family are in spain and she's not seen them and her sadness really hit me in terms of you know or oh, how we're all dealing with this better um, differently and two days later i was in a meeting with our senior management group across our museums um, and our conversations of course came about how we're supporting each other and how people were feeling and another colleague talked about overwhelming sadness that come on her in those couple of days that she was really struggling with and we had a discussion about organizational mental health and our need to support each other um, there and we have to be considerate in our decision making even when some of us are dealing with tough decisions and michael talked about the you know the difficulties that are happening at the moment in national trust scotland being thoughtful and sen sensitive in decision making whatever they are and thinking and treating the thinking of people um in kind ways and being thoughtful to each other um and even when people aren't kind actually and react um negatively or angrily we have to understand that although none of us should put up with intimidating and, and poor behavior that, that there is reasoning behind this i am concerned that we're galloping towards a national health a, a national mental health crisis here that we're ill prepared for and that's among young people and old people um, affecting us personally with friends and family in our workplaces and colleagues and out in our communities but museums change lives the examples that we all know and have looked at together show how powerful our collections are when our gifted and committed people um, are making those collections sing so um, you know out of this dreadfulness there are opportunities to think of how we can use our collections and when we can our beautiful spaces uh, for that wonderful healing positive power they, that they can bring at the right time so opportunities are there opportunities there for more meaningful work with our communities um, both digitally and on site and we have seen some joyful creativity and imaginative development of programs and content delivery um, right across uh, learning collections events fundraising right across the whole gamut of work that we do in museums and of course i hope we've all been um, absolutely waving the flag for our unsung heroes our colleagues who uh, in it and finance and hr who've really kept us all going um, but opportunities for us i think as a sector as well that's all about permanence and we've often talked about how we're not always uh, always as agile as perhaps our colleagues in the art sector because of the permanence of what we do um, that we move more slowly well here we are we've all moved really quickly and there's huge learning to do from that it's taken us forward at uh, certainly three years five years or more and we should celebrate that um, 
there are huge challenges about structural change, as, as Michael referred to, um, and moving on to more online resources, uh, potentially, and huge internal change. Is that going to mean we're having more conversations about how we share resources internally, externally with other museums and community organisations, and even looking at things like mergers, which often feel like hideous challenge, but maybe opportunities for longer term resilience and put us on a stronger footing, who knows? But again, there are things that are challenges, but there could be a glimmer of an opportunity in there. I also think there's a real positivity in the way that the public have understood the value of our museums um, during lockdown and also, of course, through um, the very traumatic Black Lives Matter events. The public have seen the values of what we can really do as museums and what we can bring to the national conversation. And I do wonder whether there's an opportunity that we have raised our game in the public psyche. And it's certainly one that I hope will be a positive that we can draw on and build on. So can we uh, um, really draw on that positivity for the future? So, you know, I guess my, I'm finishing with what, you know, what next? We are, many of us are now, not all of us I'm very aware. There is a danger of complacency still, although we're all being reminded all the time that we cannot cannot take anything for granted will we be looking we're already looking at local lockdowns is there still a national um one or across different different uh nations and regions still on the cards who knows but the trends are really worrying um but i guess i want to finish with that plea for kindness and consideration across our museums and with each other the real opportunities that we've learned to value each other more and i do look forward with confidence always the eternal optimist but i do look forward with confidence because museums can and do change lives we aren't the national health service and we cannot fix the world the world's ills and we certainly can't fix the pandemic but we can have a place in really getting through this and remembering and coming out of it um, with thoughtful, often sombre ways forward to strengthen our museums and support national conversations and conversations in our wonderful um, communities. So we may come out a nation, I think, battered and possibly um, uh, bruised long term, but I think we'll be coming out also with some wisdom drawn from real experience. So thank you all for, for um, being here and I'm sorry I can't see you all in person, but thank you for joining us and for your support for the MA. We are a charity and Sharon will talk more about um, our work during lockdown, but I hope that you feel that the MA has been supporting you, but thank you too for your support for the Museums Association. Thank you. Back to you, Michael. Thank you very much, Maggie. Um, I think sort of the, um, the the appeal to kind of kindness and patience and um, being good to each other and ourselves is very kind of um, important at the moment with the, the stresses we're all kind of facing. Um, so moving on then, um, I'm delighted to kind of introduce Sharon Heald, Director of the Museum Association, and Sharon's going to be talking a little bit about, I guess, what the MA has been doing um, to help museums and, and us all through this kind of um, coronavirus kind of crisis. So Sharon, over to you. Thank you, Michael. I'm going to attempt to share my screen, uh, do a, a very sort of basic presentation, uh, just so you don't have to look at me and you've got something more interesting to look at. Okay, so you should hopefully be able to see that. So thank you, Michael, and thank you, Maggie, for that great introduction to today's members meeting. I think it's really pertinent, the points that Maggie made about kindness and, and being positive in the face of the challenges that we have in the sector, but also that point about front of house staff and, and breaking down barriers and valuing that warm welcome that we give to the public. We had a coronavirus conversation webinar yesterday evening on front of house and the people on the panel from front of house positions who spoke there and, and contributed with questions from the audience we're really making the point that we hope one of the things that lasts out of this crisis is the way that we value and treat our front of house staff and understand the professionalism within that role so like a lot of the museums that we represent we had to make some swift and uh, sometimes difficult decisions as a result of the pandemic and the lockdown 
the week before the lockdown, myself and members of the senior management team were in Edinburgh before a meeting of the conference panel for our conference this year. And on the evening of that meeting, we were sitting in a hotel uh, bar discussing whether we would have to lock down the office. The office. I'm ever the optimist and I was saying, no, I don't think it'll come to that. And obviously, lo and behold, a week later, we were sending all staff home and making arrangements for them to work at home. Within days, we were putting that plan into action. And we had no idea when we did that, that six months later, that a huge change would have been wrought on the sector, on the world, on society, and that we would still be working from home as we are. And we know that we're fortunate in that all of our staff can work from home. And we know that's not the case, as Maggie said, for everybody who works in museums and galleries. Again, I think it's an opportunity for us to take stock and recalibrate and think about what the pandemic means for new ways of working some of which could be positive. I think many, as, many of us have experienced a better work-life balance, even if we've had children bombing our Zoom meetings than we've ever experienced before. But we know many institutions were not set up for staff to work at home and that doesn't apply to all roles. And we know, as already referenced, that we're coming to that point now as the furlough scheme ends when organisations are making very difficult decisions and many people face a big question mark about their future career. So we're doing all that we can to take that external context into consideration and to make sure that we support the sector as well as we can. And one of the ways that we've done that is go back to basics, back to our values, back to our mission, which is inspiring museums to change lives, our vision, which is for inclusive, participatory and sustainable museums at the heart of their communities, and our values, which are centered around inclusivity, diversity and equality. And that has stood us, stood us in really, really good stead in order to face some of the challenges that we know the sector faces and our museum members face. So we decided that our priorities from the beginning should be staff welfare, our staff welfare, business continuity, member support, and supporting the wider sector. And I know every organisation should have, would have gone through that process of looking back at its business plan, looking at its mission, vision, and values of rolling out those emergency plans and understanding what we face is a, a once in a lifetime, once in a generation, hopefully, challenge. We recognise we can't do anything without our people, without our staff, but also without our brilliant reps. We have fantastic reps in Scotland, without our fantastic trustees who are, add amazing value to the work of the organisation. We have 20 members of staff at the Museums Association, and that's great to have that resource. It's absolutely fantastic but we can't do all that we do without our reps and our trustees. And it's part of recognising that people make museums. Museums are about a lot of things in terms of buildings and, and, and the fabric of the building and the collection, obviously, and the history of that collection. I think they're first and foremost about people. We've had to obviously ensure our business continuity, and I know that has been on the minds of many people who work in the sector in Scotland and institutions to, to think about business continuity in this really difficult period. But, but we can't help you unless we've got our business model in order and, and we, don't take, we don't get any public funding. So we're built on the subscriptions of our members. And, and we've tried to uh, retain, retain members, obviously, in this difficult period, which we, we have been able to do, but also give discounts and added benefits and added value to our members. So we've had to move the conference that we were going to hold in Edinburgh online, but the advantage is that's now free to all of our individual and institutional members. We've got a whole week of content starting on the 2nd of November, 
And the other advantage is, obviously, we can zoom in speakers from around the world. So I had a conversation online with uh, somebody in Argentina yesterday who's going to bring together an international panel from across the Americas, which we just wouldn't normally be able to do that in real life. So we've got to you know, look at and focus on those positives. We, we're supporting our members through a range of content online, through CPD and our new workforce offers, and, and Tamsin will talk more about this later. And we're also supporting that wider sector advocacy and making a really strong case for museums. And I, I hope the panel will touch on this later, but it's been a real pleasure to work with colleagues from across Scotland through all the different sector support organisations and membership bodies. So we've worked obviously with Museums Gallery Scotland, with Industrial Museums Scotland, with University Museums Scotland, with Vocal, with the National Museum, with the Association of Independent Museums to make the strongest possible case. And it's been really, pr I've been really proud and, and gratified that our, uh, those, some of those organisations and our members have asked us to take a lead on advocacy. So we've been able to put together joint messaging, joint responses to the committee inquiries on the impact of COVID-19 at local government level, but also the culture committee. We pulled together press campaigns and letters to ministers with the support of colleagues in all of those organisations. And going forward, we know you know, we have to help ourselves. We can make a really good strong case now for emergency and recovery funding. We can get the data and the evidence together in order to evidence that need, but we also need to come up with some solutions ourselves. So we don't want to get to the stage when a solution is imposed on us piecemeal across Scotland. We want to be brave and look at what some of the options are. And we want to involve all of you, our members across Scotland, in that conversation starting today and then to carry that on. Obviously, workforce is absolutely critical to us as a membership organisation. We have over 12,000 12, individual members and over 1,500 museums. And that's everything from volunteer museums to national museums and people who work front of house, back of house, and in leadership positions. And that together make, helps us make a powerful case. So if you're here as, uh, because your institution is a member, I would urge you to join us as an individual. If you're here because you're an individual, I would urge you to make the case to your institution to join because it's that collective that helps us make that big case to government and to funders. And we've been able to put, I hope, a, a good package in place for our members. Some of you will have already taken part in Museum Essentials, our online tra training modules. We've got one on ethics, we've got one on collections, and our one on working in partnership with communities will be launched soon. And we've got well over a thousand learners on those courses. In addition, on workforce, we've had a, a brilliant offer put together by Tamsin career conversations at the beginning of lockdown, essential mentoring and leadership mentoring. We created a Facebook furlough group, which is, is going to change in nature over the course of the next couple of weeks and extend its reach. We've got the group for managing in a crisis. And as I said, Tamsa will talk in more detail about that offer later. And we've also got lots of content. I was going to talk about the online content because we've got three newsletters a week which you can subscribe to. And I also wanted to mention the fact that we've got Museum's Journal back in print now because it arrived today. So that's a picture of it on my kitchen table. I was delighted to see it back in print. But we've upped our game, I think, in terms of producing the practical content that we hope will support you in your work, but also the news and the views that will help us understand what's going on and how we can uh, navigate this really tricky period. We've developed online events, such as this members meeting and the webinars that I mentioned. So we've had those webinars on leadership in a crisis, workforce wellness, reopening, learning and engagement, and last night, front of house. We've had huge engagement. We've had thousands of people on those webinars over the course of the last few months, and they are free for our members. And we're looking at how we can adapt and support 
all of those offers so that we can help you and your museum or the museum that you work with in these difficult times. We're carrying on our policy work. So we, as many of you know, we'll ha we have a decolonization guidance working group. We've been doing intensive research on learning and engagement, and we hope to launch some of that research and a manifesto on learning and engagement at our conference in November, and also campaigning on some of the issues that have come up over the last 12 months, because obviously it's not just coronavirus, uh, Black Lives Matter and the movement around that has been a really significant happening that has affected all of us and all of our institutions. We issued a joint statement with other sector organisations, but we know that we need to turn words into action. So we've been working with other organisations, including Culture Round, which produced a, a charter on the topic. And we have a webinar coming up, as Michael mentioned, on dismantling racism in museums, which is being hosted by Museum Detox. I mentioned the conference. I think that's going to be an amazing opportunity for us to share across the UK, across our nations and internationally our experience, but also our conversation about what next. And one of the things that I think has been absolutely critical over the last six months has been our code of ethics. Our ethics committee has met in this period and has had some really rigorous conversations about what the coronavirus and Black Lives Matter and the other things that have happened mean in terms of ethics. We've had the conversations about disposal because of the pressure on finances, but also the conversations about the statues coming down or whether the statues should come down. And there are real live cases being referred to the Ethics Committee on that. I think a really interesting conversation. One of the first things that we did was publish guidance on contemporary collecting, ethical guidance on that, because of course people in museums want to collect from the crisis and have done so. And the question is, how can we do that working with our communities and making sure we don't just end up with lots more stuff? How can we do it with sensitivity and respect? You know, people are still dying, people are still grieving, so we must do it ethically and with, with respect to, the, to our communities. We've also provided funding for our sector. This image is from Glasgow Women's Library, actually, and I think they have been funded as a result of the Esme Fairburn Collections Fund, but we diverted some of their funding to an emergency response to a, a funding stream called Sustaining Engagement with Collections, which hits a real need, £350,000 for small projects to think about how we take some of that brilliant engagement we did in lockdown and build on that and develop, and develop that. And we've also had funding for individuals via our Benevolent Fund for inclusive membership places or hardship through our hardship fund. And we worked with the Museum Freelance Network to produce some grants for people who are suffering hardship as freelancers. So move to my last slide, which for those of you that are working or living in Edinburgh, I'm sure you'll be familiar with. I was in Edinburgh last week and I was delighted to see this uh, next to the Museum of Childhood as a response to Black Lives Matter and uh, a really lovely, beautiful poem, Beloved Black by Jedda Pearl. And I know that those are dotted around the city and many of them next to museums. And um, sadly, the museums are not quite open yet, but I know there's, there's news on that that I'm sure Gillian will be able to fill us in. But we've thought a lot as the MA about how we respond to contemporary events. That movement that toppled the statue of Colston feeds directly into our work on decolonisation. And as I said, we hope to produce guidance for people who work in museums and galleries on that subject. It was a moment in time when the guidance working group last met during Black Lives Matter that we had to consider the, the, the height of the campaign, that we had to consider the relationship between the work of that group and what was happening more broadly in society. And it, it was 
it, it was a it was a difficult discussion to have, but it was it was the right discussion to have to, to force us to think beyond the sometimes narrow constraints of our sector and our institutions. And I think coronavirus has given us the opportunity to do that. I think I'll finish on this point that we're at a turning point, and despite all of the pressures we face and all of the challenges, it's an opportunity to think about the future of museums and to shape the future of the muse of museums and we really want your support to be able to do that. Thank you. Right, thank you very much Sharon. Um, can we move on now then? I've just noticed there's a couple of kind of just to remind people about the use of the kind of the chat and the Q&A panel because there's a, um, if you have got specific questions, please use the kind of the, the Q&A um, and that will then go to kind of any of the speakers or kind of um, participants in the, in, in the session. Um, the chat can be just used for kind of comments and things, but if you have a specific question you want a response to, then please do go to the, the, the Q&A and use that, um, use that function instead. Um, so I'm going to move on and introduce um, our, our first panel of this afternoon, um, which is chaired by um, Gillian Findlay um, of Museums Galleries Edinburgh. Um, and Jill, I'm going to ask you to kind of introduce everybody in your in your group rather than um, do it myself, if that's not too rude to do. Are you there, Jill? Yes, you are. Oh, you still need to push that. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. And you can see me. <laughs> I'm never sure. <laughs> um, Michael, thank you so much. And hello, everybody. Um, it's really strange having a Scotland members event, but not being able to see the Scottish members. Um, I'm really hoping, though, that you will, many of you will feel uh, compelled to take part in the panel discussion as we go along and I'm absolutely thrilled to be chairing this wonderful panel. Um, we have a lot to cover and we've got a wee while to do it actually so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick off now and as we go along I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves rather than have me do it. Um, as you know the discussion today is around collaboration in the sector. We know that the museum's world is not perfect. Um, there are areas where culturally we're just too slow to move on our practice or to recognize and action the need for positive change. Um, and arguably, I would argue, uh, our ability and propensity to forge strategic external partnerships with those people and organizations working outside our sector, but with complementary aims and objectives and priorities is, is one example of that. And it's an example that has always perplexed me. Um, it's always struck me as odd because our enthusiasm and our appetite for working together across and within our sector is so great. Um, I think it's fair to say that museums have long had in-sector collaboration nailed. And as Sharon said earlier, people make museums. We're all about relationships. Collaboration is an established way of working for museums people. And actually, our, our, our talent in doing that is something that I regularly hear commented upon. Um, it's envied, it's lauded by colleagues working in other areas of heritage across the UK and more broadly in the cultural world. I think too it's notable for the breadth and the diverse nature of the collaborative models that are in operation in museums. We're all here today, for example, as members of the world's oldest museums association, which advocates, as Sharon has so richly told us just now, for what we do, for everything we do, UK wide, providing training, access to funding, and really importantly, networking opportunities like this meeting today. Um, but many of us will also be members of multiple other groups, um, perhaps groups reflecting the types of organization that we work for, the nation, region, or, or local area in which we live, 
the broad nature of our jobs and the specific subject um, or field that we specialise in. Some groups, as we know, offer formal and institutional support. Others are dedicated to individual and peer support. And increasingly, some exist to highlight and address areas of social inequality and injustice which affects the museum's workforce. Sector support bodies and funders um, often, um, sorry, I've lost my thread there. Give me a second. Yes, sector support bodies and funders often encourage and reward partnership or joint working, both in practical and strategic terms. And here in Scotland, um, our government's um, culture strategy, as you will all be aware, places culture at the centre of the administration, feeding into and working across other key areas of public life, notably health, education and the economy. And we're a small enough country to benefit from a workable, uh, from workable national relationships. And there's no doubt that that brings an unusual intensity uh, of insight and effectiveness to some, to some of our networks. So collaboration, the sharing of information, ideas, resources, intellectual, and often importantly, emotional support is not just a desirable thing, but it's a natural and a necessary way of working in museums. Joining me today, our panelists represent four groups which are key to this infrastructure in Scotland. I'm delighted they're here today to talk not just about who they work with, um, many of them will represent some of you, um, uh, and how they operate, but to explore a bit about specifically what has altered in the last six months in light of the COVID-19 pandemic and its ongoing devastating effects. In a moment, I'll ask them to introduce themselves and their organisation and we'll get started on the discussion. But please do note, we've reserved a good 10 minutes or so at the end of the panel discussion to take your questions from the floor. There's no need to wait until we finish chatting on the panel though. <clears throat> do fire through your, your queries, your comments, uh, or your, just your thoughts about what's being discussed as we go. And as Michael said, the Q&A function is there for that purpose, but do use the chat if that's easier. Between us, Simon and I will keep an eye on that and make sure that everything um, you put forward will be considered by the panel. We do really want to hear from you, MA members, about what your immediate asks are from all of your support networks. Where is investment needed? Where are the areas you feel are particularly under threat? Uh, and where do you feel advocacy activity needs to be directed? So, we're going to get started. On that note, uh, I'm going to ask the panel members in front of me to, in turn, introduce each other. I'm not suggesting you come back to me, it'll be too clunky. We'll just go in alphabetical order. So if David, you could start, and then Emma, Fiona, and then last but certainly never least, Sarah Burry Hayes. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are, the forum you're representing today, who its members are and its aims? And we'd all love to hear a little bit about you and why you got involved in the network that you're representing. David. Thanks, Jill. Um, so my name is David McLeod. I'm the marketing officer for Culture Perth and Kinross, and I'm also one of the founding uh, members of the Scottish Heritage Social Media Group. Um, so the Scottish Heritage Social Media Group, it was set up by myself and a colleague, uh, Julianne McGraw, who works for Digit in 2016. And the idea behind it was to basically encourage uh, social media learning, knowledge exchange, and sort of cross promotion of uh, Scotland's growing cultural heritage sectors. At the time, I was in the Scottish Museums Federation as a digital officer and Julianne herself kind of identified that there was a bit of a gap for a sort of a network of people who specifically looked at social media communications marketing in the sector. So between us we set up the organisation, we've since added a third uh, sort of key group member, Sally Pentecost, who's a communications officer also at Digit, and the project is backed by Digit. Um, and the idea around it is that we host we sorry, coordinate free meetups uh, across the country, primarily across the central belt. Um, and the idea is 
it's to introduce people to the voices behind the different accounts that exist. So, for example, go to VMA Dundee, go to the National Library. Emma has hosted an event for us for Go Industrial. And it allows us to kind of introduce and discuss um, different challenges we face, uh, things that we have been working on in the sector, any projects that we've done, and basically open up sort of partnership events and any training opportunities. And the, these meetups, they're designed to be informal, they're very relaxed. We also provide a safe space for people to kind of sound off if there are any specific issues that people are kind of getting irritated by or any sort of day-to-day -day issues that people are finding coming through on their social media channels. And we kind of group think uh, ways to solve it, kind of offer some, offer some advice. And sometimes people who work in social media, it's really not, they can be on the brunt of abuse. Um, I'm fortunate that I've never been on the back end of any sort of abuse. However, I've, there are colleagues that I know who work on other social media accounts who have been on the back end of abuse. And sometimes it is good for them to sort of safely, calmly kind of walk through it and maybe share share some feelings around how they're, feel, how they're feeling about the abuse that their organization might be getting and then hopefully get some support from other members in the group. Um, and it's just basically, it's a, it's a safe space, it's an informal space. And we try to do them every other month. Um, we've done them in Edinburgh, Dunfermline, Stirling, Glasgow, Perth. And we just try to get around the country and try and see as much, um, basically try and get out as best as we can. And we, prior to lockdown, um, we were looking at expanding our reach, maybe stretching a bit further across the country. We were kind of very conscious. We'd kind of spent time in Angus, kind of spent time uh, Perth and Ken Ross, Glasgow, Central Belt, and we hadn't really gone anywhere. We were looking at expanding into the Highlands. But unfortunately, with lockdown, that had to be completely stopped. We had to put the brakes on an event we were having in April, and then we had to completely regroup and think how we wanted to do our our events going forward so our intention was always to be a network and a support group and with lockdown it's kind of given us the opportunity to bring our events online to show that they can be done online but also allow us to kind of reach a bigger audience as well and um, so that's what we've uh, been able to do during lockdown and we have run two events previously and we're now going to be running our third one at the end of this month um, so yeah, the, the, the whole intention of the group, just to kind of look back around, was just to give people like a safe space for anybody that worked in social media in the cultural and heritage sector. And very kind of specifically, we wanted it to be open and as accessible to as many people as possible. We're kind of very aware that when people talk about museum groups, they feel that archives and libraries can be exclu um, excluded from these groups. And we were kind of very mindful that it was literally anybody who worked in heritage across Scotland that was the key thing so heritage archaeology libraries galleries archives museums anything is the main thing was you were working in heritage in some capacity and with social media and that's allowed us to kind of meet people who work at historic houses and um, who work on specific projects that are funded uh, who work for organizations that you know have a national reach or organizations who are very much just project contained but also gives people the chance to sort of provide the support and get the support they need and effectively like create like a sounding board so people can ask questions and um, share good practice and bad practice as well. So I think that's kind of summarized it in, in a nutshell. So I will hand over to Emma next. Thanks, David. Um, my name is Emma Halford Forbes. I'm the coordinator for Industrial Museums Scotland. Um, we are a, um, well, as the name suggests, we are Industrial Museums in Scotland, a federation of, um, we have 14 members with 15 museums across 16 sites. Um, our members are spread all across Scotland, um, from the Museum of Scottish Lighthouses in Fraserburgh in the north to the Devil's Porridge Museum. Uh, uh, in Dunfries and Galway in the south, Auchendrain Township in Argyll in the west and the Scotch Fisheries Museum um, in Fife on the, in the east. Um, our museums are all independent charities, all but one of them are accredited museums. Um, all but four hold collections recognised as being of national significance and one is a World Heritage Site. 
Um, our mission is to operate a partnership to ensure the sustainability of Scotland's industrial museums um, and that has been incredibly important over the last six months. Um, there are at least a couple of hundred independent museums in Scotland and a higher percentage per capita than elsewhere in the UK. Um, and IMS only represents only a few of those, but it does represent a range of them. Um, and during our advocacy work, um, we've tried to be as inclusive um, of the wider independent muse museum sector as we can. Um, I've started in post about four years ago. Um, I have a background in community development and museum development um, and coming to work for IMS um, has been an absolute pleasure. Um, getting to work with some of the top collections across the country and some fantastic sites, um, it's, it's, it's been, been really great. Um, and the last six months have been very challenging um, and I'm really looking forward to talking a bit more about that. But I'll hand over to Fiona just now. Thanks Emma. Uh, so I'm Fiona Thornton, I'm President of the Scottish Museums Federation. Uh, the Fed is a membership body for anyone working, volunteering or who's just interested in Scotland's museums. We support our membership with professional development and networking opportunities. Uh, so we have about 200 members throughout Scotland from local authority, university, national and independent museums, uh, working and volunteering in a range of roles as well as many people who are new to the sector, so undertaking internships, traineeships, or museum studies degrees. Uh, we offer a professional development grant, and we run a series of pop-up events, a social Christmas quiz, and an annual conference in different locations across the country. Uh, we have a range of communication platforms to share network news, jobs, training, and funding opportunities, including a newsletter, blog, and our social media channels. Our committee is made up of 11 museum professionals. Um, we're all volunteers and do it in our own time. Um, so we do sometimes lack capacity to, to do more, um, but we come from a range of Scottish museums, work in a variety of roles, and so we think therefore we are quite reflective of the sector overall. Um, I joined the committee in April of 2019 as membership officer. Um, I had always kind of been a big fan of the Fed. I felt it was a really friendly atmosphere, um, particularly at early career stage. Um, and I was elected president this summer, so it's still very new to me to be in this role. Uh, so I'll hand over to Sarah. Hi everyone, thanks Fiona. Um, I'm Sarah Burry Hayes. I am the coordinator for University Museums in Scotland, which is UMIS because it's a really long name. Um, we have nine members. Uh, they're the accredited university uh, museums in Scotland or university collections in Scotland. Um, we aren't as extensive as Emma's group or as the other groups. We, um, we're sort of like a backward L. We go from Aberdeen down to Edinburgh, across to Glasgow, basically. Um, we have a range of members from the Hunterian, who are huge, to um, Harriet Watt and Dundee, who are weeny teeny. Um, I'm the first coordinator they've ever had. So no pressure. Um, I was <laughs> I was appointed last year. Um, they got a grant uh, uh, from from MGS, who I used to work for. So um, so I'm now this wonderful uh, University Museums in Scotland coordinator. I have to say that um, University Museums are solely unique. They are utterly brilliant, and I love working with them. But it was a humongous learning curve to learn about special collections and archives and why everything's different and why people don't talk to each other. Um, but, uh, but no, it, it's been a really fantastic time. Our aims are a bit tricky. They're sort of split between academia and heritage. So we have a sort of learning, teaching and research remit on one hand, uh, which is what our universities find the most important. Um, but equally, we have a unique position as a conduit between our communities and our universities. So we find that uh, the most important work we do is within widening participation, community programming, um, health and well-being, which is something that's very relevant at the moment, um, and a, a range of, sort of schools and learning activities for those out with higher education, or those even aspiring to be in higher education. So. Um, that's us uh, in a nutshell. I think I'll pass back to Jill now before I start waffling. <laughs> Thank you all very much. That was very succinct, but you got across exactly what you do beautifully. So thank you. Um, I've got a couple of questions for you, which I'm gonna 
um, pause in just a second for you to jump in. But before we do, there is a very practical question that I think we can address. In fact, there's a couple of very practical questions I think we can address straight away. Um, so panel, can, uh, well, David specifically in the first instance, um, Lindsay Clark, hello, Lindsay. Lindsay's asking, David, is if there's an organization looking for Scottish heritage social media support on a freelance or consultancy basis, do you have members that you can share that request with? Um, we can definitely put it in front of people. Um, our network kind of exists to promote like social media opportunities. Um, we have put ourselves with the Fair Jobs policy. Um, so people who are familiar with Fair Jobs, so we only ask that any any sort of um, salary or payment or anything is uh, kind of in line with the Fair Jobs policy that exists. Um, and but basically, we're happy to receive anything if people want to get in touch. We're happy to share anything if people are looking, you know, for opportunities. Again, happy to put them out. We can't guarantee will and anything will come off that. But again, as long as it kind of fits the criteria of its its heritage, its uh, social media, and the payment is sits in line with fair jobs again just happy to share it just uh, tweet at us at scott heritage smg or just send us an email great thank you david that was clear um and complimentary to that one for the whole panel there's a little bit of discussion in the q a about um freelancing and katie firth is asking she's currently freelancing and she's wondering is there a scottish specific group for museum freelancers are any of you aware of that I think that's a no for now. I think there's there's something on Twitter which is a, a freelance a museum freelance group. Um, I I know very little about them, but it might <laughs> might be worth looking. David, you might know more about that, but I, I've seen it pop up from time to time. So yeah, again, um, it's something I've come across, but I get again because I'm not a freelancer and I don't really work in sort of freelancer circles. Um, that's about the extent of my knowledge, I'm afraid. Yeah, and there's a comment again in the in the chat that there is on, as you say, on Twitter. There's the at Museum Freelance Network, not Scottish specific, but UK wide. So that's probably a good place to start. And if it's anything like the Space Invaders Network, um, a Scottish chapter has has come from that pretty quickly from being a, a you know based in England, but but essentially UK wide, and it's developed and specialised a little bit. Okay, um, panel, my my next question for all of you. Um, I'm really interested, as I know uh, our wider members here, the attendees are, about the kinds of engagement that you had with your members during lockdown and since. What, what kind of support did you find that your members were looking for? Had it changed from the usual kinds of support that was needed? So, so what was really needed and, and, and where? Who would like to jump in? I'm happy to go first. Um... Thanks. Uh, my focus um, since the start of the outbreak was to support our members and to advocate on uh, their behalf and that's one of the key things that IMS um, has done since, um, since it started. Um, from the outset our concern was the survival of independent museums and by survival I mean staying financially solvent. Um, and which as charities um, they have to. Um, this still remains a concern, but I'm not calling it a grave concern anymore. So, so that's, that's progress. Um, our IMS uh, directors began meeting weekly and sometimes twice weekly. They usually only meet every quarter and they're fairly perfunctory meetings, but these meetings became weekly and as I say, twice weekly, just for an informal catch up to compare notes and discuss common issues. Um, that kind of started, um, you know, me thinking about what we, what messages we really needed to be getting out there. But it was also very interesting just to sit and have it. And we're actually still meeting weekly um, that, that people are still feeling the need to actually sit and have a chat with peers about what's going on. Um, uh, and, and, you know, I mean, that's been happening against all all kind of levels um, of museums. Um, our directors were to spend a lot of time speaking about um, really awful things like how many weeks they had left or until the reserves were used up. Um, talking about emergency funding and um, talking about the job retention scheme um, how to furlough staff and responsibilities to staff during that time um, and talking about um, other types of support funds whether they're eligible I mean so many conversations about so many funds um, yeah we were all, we were all doing that I think um, but these meetings were really cru crucial in terms of data gathering um, and in terms of steering our priorities um, during the crisis 
Um, in terms of what support they were asking for, um, in terms of grants, our museums applied for literally everything that was going from the Third Sector Resilience Fund to the Enterprise Resilience Fund, NLHF to MGS funds. Some got support from local authorities. Um, the non-heritage sector funding really illustrated how inconsistent support could be. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of people who, who, who've been applying for grants who agree with that, that you just never, literally never knew if you were going to get it or not. Um, I was amazed that there were some organisations that got grants from a particular scheme, scheme and then others didn't. Um, and I don't know if that's if they were in a rush to get their funding streams out or overwhelmed with applications, but there was pretty patchy coverage from some, some funders. Um, but, you know, try not to complain. It was obviously a lot of it was over and above what would normally be there. So it was amazing. Um, all of our museums use the job retention scheme and most still are to some extent. Um, this was an absolutely essential um, lifeline in some very dark days. I'm um, not going to admit when I heard the announcement, I started crying in the kitchen. Um, and I can absolutely say that most museums would have been forced um, to make swathes of staff redundant before now, um, if not have had to close if it hadn't been for the job retention scheme. So it has been absolutely vital. And obviously there is some concern about what's going to happen um, in only a few weeks um, when, when that ends. Um, from the outset, we've been collecting data from our members and consulting with our colleagues across the sector to advocate for, um, for IMS members, but also for the wider independent sector as well. Um, the emergency funding from MGS and NLHF were absolutely crucial um, and without that several of our members would have faced really really difficult times and um, the recovery and resilience funding from MGS we hope will continue to provide essential support for independent museums in this financial year. Um, however, as sort of been mentioned, we are already looking to, um, we have a, 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 an ALIO, a former local authority a museum trust, um, cultural trust, um, that's one of our members. Um, and so we are looking um, to uh, how we can help advocate for support for civic and university museums. And um, that is still really to materialise um, uh, and is a growing concern for the sector at the moment. So that's me. Thank you very much, Emma. I think you've touched on the advocacy and the fundraising and I suspect are going to be common themes for all the groups. But tell me if I'm wrong, Fiona, Sarah, David, who'd like to jump in? Sarah. Um, I'll go next. <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much what Emma said, apart from the funding bit. Um, we, as Emma touched on, we as university museums are still slightly concerned. We haven't had our budgets. Our students don't get back until this weekend might be a time to avoid centres of towns, just saying. Um, but, you know, until that's, that's really settled in, we know our universities have been modelling on scenarios as, as far as what their, um, what percentage of their capacity of students they're going to get. And that includes international students who obviously are those that pay. Um, so depending on what their models look like, we are um, awaiting what uh, the the impact of that is going to be on on our services in addition we are part funded by the scottish funding council who this is where we differ slightly from the rest of the heritage sector we're actually predominantly funded through education and not through heritage so that adds an extra little cuisson when you're looking for funding for heritage attractions <laughs> um and they don't really know what a heritage attraction is or how it operates so um We've had some fantastic uh, conversations with MA, IMS, the Fed, MGS, um, you know, I, they are too, uh, too many to mention, but, but everybody has been really super supportive. And I think that that really backs up what people have been saying so far is that this, this, this pandemic crisis, unprecedented situation, however you want to put it, is, is really highlighted how our sector does tend to pull together um, around certain issues of, of grave importance to, uh, to its, its members, basically. Um, but I, I, I touch on something that was also said um, in the introduction today, which is that actually as a coordinator, you are um, you're impartial and therefore there is, uh, there is a sense of providing emotional support at times. And actually I've had a lot of highly confidential conversations with people, be they within UMIS or out with UMIS, um, just about how people are feeling and, and how, how it's actually impacting on their mental health as well as on their services. Um, and in that vein, our committee has been meeting every two weeks to share 
you know, their resource, but also their concerns. But that really highlighted to me the need to uh, segment our communications. So I set up a specific channel just for the core committee members so that they would feel able to discuss potentially some really quite upsetting um, considerations that they, they might have been having to, having to um, deal with at that time without having that impact on the rest of, of the members of UMIS. Likewise, I extended the, the communication with the rest of the teams within UMIS so that we could, we could incorporate more talking amongst um, uh, these teams who are all basically all the same team when you're at home. You're not going into an office, you're not, you're not doing certain things. And, and, and that, that really kicks out um, a lot of opportunity for people to work together where, where I feel that they possibly hadn't felt that free to do that before, or they'd felt that there had been something in place that constricted that, that, that possibility. So um, we had some real positives come out of that, 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 that this sense of freedom, this sense of, I always used to joke, nobody has a clue what they're doing at the moment. This was right at the beginning of lockdown. Nobody has a clue what they're doing. No one knows how this works. Zoom calls are failing left, right and center. Teams isn't working. We don't know what we're doing. Um, and actually within that environment, people felt really, really free to try some new things. And, and I think that that's, we've got to keep hold of that. When we start talking about what we're going to do next, we've really got to keep hold of that feeling of freedom and that feeling of, of those boundaries almost being blurred into how we can work with others so that we can really build on that in future. We, we've had far more within UMIS and within the Scottish Museum sector, we've had so much more communication and so much more partnership working during lockdown. It's been an absolute delight, that side of things. There have been a lot of drawbacks, but you know that side of things. I, I think we we've really got to focus on that now because unless we do, you just worry. It's just an incessant yes. Like let's wake up and worry about what's going to happen today. So um, I think that's what what we really learned about this. A apart from the real the real mundane stuff, like writing some social media guidelines, was the first thing I did when we went into lockdown because our smaller members hadn't done social media before. So I wrote a really, I called it the quick and dirty and it was basically, here's what you might wanna be talking about. Here's the audience that might be interested. Here's some people to tag because otherwise you're not gonna get your news out there at all. So it was some really like, you have to turn them around really quickly and get them out really quickly. But just being that flexible and being that responsive week on week and I think that the rest of the guys will probably agree with me is that things kept popping up that you went I had no idea this was coming um okay right we'll deal with it and you know I think to a certain extent it, it is um I don't know it, it, it's it's what happens for the rest of the time but condensed into a very short period of time where that responsiveness really has to be ramped up so um so yes all the advocacy doing loads Sarah, I don't know if it's you that's frozen or or me, but you've you've frozen big time. So I'm going to move on. Thank you, Sarah. There was a lot in there that I thought was really really helpful, and some words fixed firmly in my mind about being free to try different things, being adaptable, flexible, and responsive. And again, I suspect these are common themes for the other networks. But David or Fiona, would you like to to respond as well before we move on, Fiona? Yeah, I, I would just totally echo what Emma and uh, Sarah were saying about um, the collaboration between networks. Um, I, I think for the Feds, um, like I said before, we do this all in a voluntary capacity. And so the way that um, I think we responded as a committee was very reflective of the sector that between um, the 11 of us, some people were you know, raring to go and wanted to try new things. Some people, it was just overwhelming. There was some on furlough and some working from home. And um, so we did just kind of take a bit of breathing space and took the approach that the main thing that we could contribute really was through our comms channels. So um, there was so many resources and guidance coming out at the start. And we, we thought the most helpful thing that we could do was just to pull that together for our members through our already existing comms channels. 
Um, the other sort of practical thing that we did was just to pause membership payments and that was very well received by um, our members. We were obviously concerned about the financial impacts um, of the coronavirus on them and the fact that our membership offer was reduced. Um, but we have still had uh, the majority of members renew and have taken on many new members. So um, yeah, that's been really interesting for us. The, the payment issue for memberships that, that do require a, a, a fee and m many do, I know there's a, a mix of informal and more formal membership across the networks, but for those who do, it's a really interesting question. And I know one that the MA has had a lot of response to with the need to go digital with conference this year. One of the biggest areas of feedback has been how positive it is that it naturally becomes much more inclusive as a result and free attendance for members, um, institutional members and individuals matters a lot, particularly in time of job insecurity for a lot of people. Um, so thank you for raising that, Fiona. I think it's a really important one. David, I'm going to come to you, but before I do, just to flag anyone who isn't following the chat, the freelancing thing is really taking off. I'm re really jealous. I'm feeling I'm missing out being someone who's very organizationally based. <laughs> but, um, it looks like there's going to be all sorts of parties going on over Zoom all over the shop. So good luck with that. Um, David, would you like to finish off with that second question for us? Yeah, sorry, can you just repeat the question again? I know, it feels like a little while ago now, doesn't it? Hang on, bear with me. Um, really interested to hear about the kind of engagement that you've had with your members since lockdown. Um, has the support that they're looking for changed? Where was the need? I think what we've found is we were we were scheduled to have a meeting. Our next meetup was April, um, so right after everything closed down, sort of the end towards the end of March. So we naturally the, the right thing to do for us was just to put the brakes on there, um, and we just took a took a moment to regroup. We all are were kind of doing different jobs. Myself working in communications and marketing for uh, CPK meant there was a, a you know you'll know yourself Jill there was a big big changes um kind of came around a lot of stuff was happening very quickly very fluid situations and um, so there wasn't really the time for us to as a as a group to completely focus on what we were doing next however taking a step back and seeing what MGS did seeing what National Trust did seeing what different organizations did in terms of uh, or organizational meetups we thought this is something we can do it allows us to reach out to people to communicate communicate to people and I think at that point we we're about a month and a half into uh, lockdown so at the point the kind of the, you know the, the working from home novelty had kind of worn off a little bit and people were starting to like seek out a bit of contact uh, with other folk albeit digitally so we were we were quite pleased we were able to kind of offer something and um, Tamsin uh, Tamsin Russell she facilitated a discussion about careers and just you know, using using the example, like if if you're perhaps furloughed or you're not working, this is the kind of the opportunity. Um, you know where you can basically take take time and reassess like what you are doing. I mean, nobody is going to be specifically looking for jobs at that time uh, in May, but it's also gives was giving people the opportunity to kind of come together, take five. Have, have a wee chat about the sector, have a wee chat about what was going on, um, reflect on their own learnings, reflect on things that maybe people have found challenging. Obviously, it was a mix of people who were working um, still doing still doing their day-to-day -day job, but at the same time, there was also people who were furloughed. There were people who were managing social for DMOs, so they were, you know, a bit arm's length with everything. So it really, really kind of gave us a chance to kind of reflect and just kind of stop and see what we could do. And that, that went down quite well. And we did a, another uh, meetup with Not, Not Your Narrative, um, which is a kind of grassroots um, movement who are sort of looking at um, anti-colonialism in museums and changing that message through social media. So again, we were, it's uh, our, our archives and it's spelt not, at not your narrative on Twitter, but we were able to host a session with them, and um, so it's three three people who were running this interdisciplinary project, and we were able to have them online and basically host a Zoom of about 70, 80 people, which for us was a massive increase in numbers. But it also it came on the back of uh, a lot of the chat around Black Lives Matter and um, the kind of movement around that. So it was very it was very topical, but it was also addressing the fact about how if you if you're de 
decol decolonize decolonizing um your institution what are you if you're saying it behind the scenes if you're saying it sorry publicly on social what are you doing behind the scenes how can that change kind of be affected and again that was something that kind of went down really well and then now we are coming to do our third event basically in a post lockdown world if you also uh dougie scott who is events officer at culture park and ross he has been doing uh, Microsoft Paint artwork for us of the collections called the Dougie Draws. We've literally just finished doing it because everything has its time and its place. Um, but Dougie and myself are going to be talking about uh, the what what we did for Perth Museum and Art Gallery, Culture Perth and Ken Ross during lockdown and how we kind of pivoted from being an organisation uh, that had like exhibitions and you know museum content to sell to like being exclusively online and how can we can kind of talk about that and um, so again just kind of going going back around and sorry i appreciate it, i'm totally waffling here um but we were able to kind of bring basically to take time see what other people had done and then bring basically identified what worked what what people were interested in and it's kind of kept the um, the awareness of the group up it has given it has given people a safe space to again just discuss what they want to discuss about social media and how um, different things have been affected uh, different organizations how are, some organizations have dealt with things quite well how some organizations have dealt with things not so well um, and it's given people a chance just to kind of be together and I, I think like we've had familiar faces coming to our meetings and we've had faces that haven't been there coming along to our meetings so I think we've kind of maintained our sort of the interest that we had in our uh, sort of membership body even though it's not really membership body it's just it's, it's a group of people with similar sort of interests and career um, but it has it has been valued and it has had a positive impact we would say and and we're happy to continue with this model for now. I mean, it's not, it's not really in anybody's interest for us to be um, cutting around central Scotland looking to go to a museum to talk about social media. We can do that online just now. I think in the list of like priorities, it's really, really low down at the moment. Um, but at the same time, it's also, like I said, it's just allowed us to kind of extend our reach, like um, just out of the central belt and just move like on more national level. Thank you, David. That's really useful. Um, I'm going to just update everybody again in case you're not, you don't have access to the Q&A. There's been some really useful references, signposting to information and also some comments and a couple of last questions that I'll finish by posting to the panel. Um, so first of all, Lucy, Jilly and others have been signposting um, interested inquirers who were looking for general information about networks an operation in Scotland to the Museums Gallery Scotland website, the Working Together pages will give you all the information you need about what exists where. And of course, the new Heritage Lottery funded um, project looking at strengthening forums, regional forums across Scotland is gonna be really, really significant. So one to look out for there as well. Um, importantly, and I feel I was remiss in my offhand comment earlier, Neil has quite rightly pointed out that inclusive uh, sorry, digital doesn't necessarily equate to inclusive. There are many who struggle with digital technology. Um, he was interested in asking which museum groups have been able to provide help with this potential access barrier. The digital divide is all too real, and I'm sorry if I minimise that. It's very, very much an issue for all of us, I think. Um, I've got a question too, which the panel might like to, oh, sorry, another comment from David. Are we in danger of forgetting about the collaborative projects that were planned before March? They're still needed and they were aimed at driving the sector forward. It was better before, but it was far from perfect. Again, really important to consider that, I think. And uh, a question from Jilly Burns. In terms of sector-wide collaboration, panel, what needs or threats should we prioritize support for first of all? There's so much to do. What's the one thing each of you would take forward if you could? Fiona. Um, I think that uh, for me, the way that networks can really work together is on advocacy at the moment and pushing that forward. I think, um, yeah, as has already been said today, this is not over and um, there are so many threats to come. And I think that um, the, the, the important thing about us working together is representing a wide range of views and experiences within the sector. So that would 
be my priority at the moment is to yeah push forward a lot of advocacy work. Thank you, Fiona. Emma? Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with Fiona on that. I think one of the things that's really um, changed for um, IMS has been the communication. So communication internally. Um, so as I said, we've gone from meeting quarterly to, to having catch ups every week and having formal meetings every month. Um, I sent out an email at the beginning of the pandemic and every single museum in IMS replied to my email. It was very exciting. It's the first time it had ever happened in four years. Um, so like those kinds of things, it only takes a pandemic. Um, those kinds of things have been really important. But the other thing that's been a, a huge step change is the communication with other sector bodies. It's just been so great to actually be able to like make progress quickly and everyone has been so accommodating and and has really been adaptive with that so i think that's been a huge thing that's changed for ims and that's changed for the scottish museum sector you know not everybody is going to see that happening all the time but i promise you we're meeting every five flipping minutes to talk about stuff um just to uh just to your your question about how things are changing um, and priorities changing we definitely see that we do have different priorities and that is definitely it's going to ref reflect the different needs um, of our members and we recognize that Scotland's museums are going to need support going forward not just this financial year not just next financial year but probably the one after as well the funding that's been made available so far is crucial but it is only a short-term fix and the reach is going to be limited because there's not an unending you know bucket of cash and so with so much uncertainty around what next year might look like um there is a really a lot of uncertainty around scotland's museums um and the medium to long term does look really worrying. So that's definitely something that we are we are working with, um, you know, working with our members and stakeholders, and we're all talking in unending meetings about about what that's going to look like going forward. To answer David's point about collaborative projects before March, um, very specifically referring to one that we had, which after about what feels like about six years of fundraising um, to get a collaborative project, um, we just got the funding, everything was in place and we, we just put out um, for a freelance conservator to come and work with our collections and our museums and um, then COVID happened um, and it's all been put on hold. Um, and, uh, you know, it was a collaborative project working with our recognized collections working across our members you know having our members coming together providing funding so that people like Fraserburgh and Dumfries and Galloway can actually meet because those are you know those it's a huge barrier travel can be a huge barrier um, and in a, in a time of zoom life and um, how ironic that the project that we had was going to be getting people traveling around the country to go and visit each other um, but um, it's it is really it has been really you know it's been really annoying not to be able to go ahead with that with that project and I, I, who knows whether it's going to be possible um even in the new year to be able to go ahead with that um you know we are ims is continuing with its other support mechanisms and um, possibly with slightly different agendas we have support groups for our marketing learning and collection staff they're continuing to meet um, but as I say our project being postponed is hugely frustrating um, and we really can't go ahead with stuff like that um even doing we, even doing things on zoom and um, we are not gonna be able to do that kind of thing um until later in 2021 if at all so um yeah watch this space thank you emma and can i um particularly i agree with everything that you've said but i would just like to second that that you you one of your opening statements about how wonderful it's been to see sector organizations collaborate and advocate for the wider benefit of, of the sector nationally. You're absolutely right. It's necessarily not something that our members are aware is happening, but it is happening. And um, thank you from the MA to everyone who has worked because the MA has been joining up with, with all everyone represented here and, and other groups to make sure that your voices are, are, are being heard and our members' voices are being heard. There's strength in numbers yeah. and, a, and a joint statement has never been more important. So let's keep it up. Um, David, would you like to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, so I would say for me, I think the job security is a big one. Um, especially in terms of uh, if you look at other organizations down south that are furloughing a lot of staff making a lot of redundancies there like I am aware there are things happening but not on the same scale but at the same time 
um, I think that is an absolute essential priority. I mean, we are, by design, we are an, uh, a sector that kind of strives to do as much as possible, but we're also striving to do as much as possible with very, very limited people, resources, money, and these costs kind of all go up. And I think it would be a sort of massive failure um, of the sector as a whole if we had to start laying off staff, um, especially just because there was no money but but looking at the staff that are always kind of being cut it's always it's always front of house it's always learning it's always retail you know and that's that to me i think they should be a priority as well and i'm not not minimizing anybody's job but i think looking at the sector as a whole and all the jobs as a whole i think we need to kind of really sort of bear in mind that we can't just like cut off the learning arm of an organization because the learning arm are the ones that bring in uh, school visits they're the ones that engage with the children they're the ones that inspire the future they're the ones that basically change lives and you do have many different roles but I think definitely kind of looking at um job security is should be like an absolute priority especially with different organizations and you know some some organizations maybe they're too big they need to kind of reassess things start from the top rather than start at the bottom i think would probably be a good way to look at stuff but oh david i think you've caught whatever sarah had um i'm going to move on and come back to you thank you david Sarah, would you like to take over? At least he's still here. I just disappeared. Um, yes, I would agree with Emma and Fiona about advocacy. I would agree with David about jobs. I would agree about future funding looking really, 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 really worrying. Um, I think within all of that, we, we, it's really difficult to prioritize. I think advocacy is like an umbrella you know, we have to advocate for our sector, we have to advocate for our organisations. And I will back up or, or third the comment on, on all of the sector organisations working together, because I think for the first time, we're backing everybody up. We're not just sitting there saying, right, you know, only certain museums should get the money or only certain museums are relevant or valid in this, in this, uh, in this situation. I think it's every single museum. Um, I would say I agree with David about job security. I, I think with the universities, that's probably something that's going to start hitting pretty soon. We know that that might be something that we're under threat of. Um, and it is usually those that do <laughs> that go and, and not those that tell people to do. Um, so, yeah, I, I would agree entirely, but I would, and I, I'm coming across as a really sort of HRE, carey, sherry person today, but I would also say that there is a massive part of our sector that needs to consider the mental health of our, of our employees. And I think that, that the HR moving forwards and that management moving forwards and that structures moving forwards have to take into account that this is almost going to be like a bit of a post-viral syndrome, no pun intended, but that there is going to be a knock-on effect and whenever that manifests or however that manifests it's going to manifest at some stage and and i think we have to be prepared for that we have to understand that that might be sorry now my cat's wanting to get involved um we now have to be very very uh careful about how we treat an illness you know we we say oh well the, the virus is gone or the virus is you know it's not gone but you know when it does <laughs> let's hope um you know that's gone and actually i think there's there's a lasting legacy there that we're going to have to every organization is going to have to deal with but we know we're quite good at dealing with stuff like that um in a lot of cases culture in the third sector and charities and you know we have a far more compassionate side to us so i think that that yeah for want of being somebody who bangs a particular drum today which I seem to be, but I think that's something, it's maybe something that we shouldn't forget. Um, but I would say that, that, that uh, future-wise for us as well, we set up some subgroups during lockdown just for mutual support, not in that Kerry Sherry way, but in a sort of professional way. And um, uh, they got some really good things off the ground digitally, which actually wouldn't have happened otherwise, and were very low cost. So, Yes, the collaborative projects from prior to lockdown 
should be considered and should always be remembered. But maybe we can look at those and see how we can change those in light of the fact that although not everybody is up to speed with, with tech now, um, that a lot more people are and that actually we might have some, some sort of resource saving um, techniques that potentially prior to lockdown we might not have had. <laughs> um, so I, I think that's also worth remembering. We're certainly going to take forward our online programming um, uh, that we managed, we managed to do a whole thing during lockdown, which is an amazing thing with 11 to 18 year olds. So that's, a, that's an audience we'd never worked with before. So lockdown provided us with that opportunity. So I think it, it's almost looking at everything holistically, not forgetting that last six months is, has existed, but trying to incorporate that into what we were doing before and see how that might improve things. So that, that's me, I'm out. What a great way to end, Sarah. I think you summed that up beautifully. Thank you very much. Um, I see Michael has appeared back on the screen. I think he's going to—he's telling us to be quiet now and finish. Yeah. Okay. Thank you to all the panelists and thank you to everybody who uh, submitted questions and chats. It's been—it's been a brilliant discussion. Lots of food for thought and lots of information to follow up on. So thank you all, Michael. Thank you very much, Jill. Um, that was such an interesting conversation. Thanks, thanks, guys, for that. I was really struck by the um, sort of some of those, I guess, those dilemmas and comments around kind of um, the way that digital is now part of our working lives and ways that it's not been before. That's certainly been very much the case for myself at the National Trust for Scotland, having now actually, in some ways, improved our communication across the organisation through doing that. And I, I guess as well, I, I would expect, and I'd be just really interested to hear from people here today as well, who perhaps wouldn't have been able to actually attend in person an all members meeting of the museum association, but we are, are able to kind of, you know, connect with you in, in this kind of way. So um, maybe once we do get back to the kind of, um, whatever kind of the future normal kind of looks like, there's still definitely a place for, I think, some of these things that we've learned um, throughout this kind of process. So that's, that's fascinating and, and everything else as well is really great. Um, so we're gonna move on now um, to, um, the person you will all know very, very well, Tamsin Russell, the um, Museums Association's um, professional development officer, who's going to talk a little bit about the kind of the ways the Museum Association can support you as individuals and, and your careers um, in, in this current situation. So Tamsin, over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. And thank you for everybody else who uh, shared their insights. Um, a, a day doesn't go by where I don't learn something around someone else's experience uh, around uh, the, the situation so we're all very very different um bear with me i don't know why my video stopped there i'm trying to share my screen so can anyone see my screen is that all right people can see my screen yeah, i can see your screen fantastic hopefully everyone has so many apologies about that so in the time that we've got together i uh, i really want to set you a challenge because i want you to think about what this current situation can mean for your professional development. And I want you to reflect on where you are, your sense of self, what we can do as the MA to support you, but also what we can all do to support one another. I think that's really, really important. My philosophy always is that if we all share, we all learn. So uh, I, I learn as much from you as you hopefully learn from, from me. I think it's really important just to note that we're all at very different starting points. You know, even if we turn the clock back five months, we will have all been in different states, uh, whether we were furloughed, working from home. Um, and now, as we go into sort of the new future, we might well be thinking about or have already returned to sites. And there's quite a number of you that may well be yo-yoing. So uh, and there might be people in the audience that are flexi furloughing, um, we might have people that are sometimes in the office, sometimes not in the office, depending on staggered work patterns. Um, and it's quite likely that that yo-yo is gonna continue, especially with the most recent announcement by the first minister. Uh, what I really want to get across is that all of these present unique challenges. And the slides I'm gonna go through over the, the next time we have together are based on discussions that I've had with people at all of these states. So what you might well find is that your own personal experience is reflected in the slides that I'm going to cover. And uh, how the slides are presented, well, let me show you what that looks like, um, is I'm taking a particular state. I want you to highlight potentially, or what I've got there is potentially some of the emotions that people have felt as a function of being furloughed. 
Then you can see there are a few bullet points about opportunities. I'm not going to talk about those in depth. We've heard from Sharon already, the good work around workforce and, and what we've been offering, but also wanted to share some hints and tips uh, around uh, what perhaps you can do if any of those issues resonate. And we'll do that for all of those three aspects. Then come together as the second part really is just to think about how you can think very tactically and strategically about your own professional development. So um, I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to get on. So our first slide is about people that were furloughed and those three bullet points at the top, you know, the sense of worth and value, sense of professional identity, sense of standing still and stagnation were things that were really strongly shared with me for all those people that are furloughed. And you may well feel that reflects your own experience. You know, people at the beginning felt very clear that they were surplus to requirements. And as much as anybody in a very logical way might say, well, that, you know, it was not a personal decision. It was a business decision. It was about cash flow. It was about not dipping into reserves. It's not about you. You're still valued. That is a really hard message to hear. So there was a huge dip in self-worth, the concept of value. There is a high overlap in our sector about what we do and who we are, which is fantastic when it's going well. But as soon as it's not going well, we take a double hit unlike other sectors or other professions. So if your real sense of self is all about being a museum professional, to not be able to connect with your collection, to not be able to connect with your colleagues, meant that people felt significantly isolated professionally. And there certainly was, and we've already talked about it in terms of collaborative projects, this concept of a lost year. So people felt as if they were put in sort of aspic, they weren't allowed to move on. You know, hopes, dreams, projects, all mothballed. Job offers, off the table, job vacancies, frozen. So all of those things had a big and significant impact on those individuals that were furloughed. We have a range of opportunities about how to remain connected, how to keep engaged, how you can learn, how you can horizon scan. You know, all of those opportunities listed there are all there and available for any of you. And if there's something that you think, oh, I don't know whether that's for me, please feel free to drop me a note, happy to blether about it at length. For me, the really clear tips around those three points is ring fencing time for you and your self-care. You know, your value is more than a museum professional, even though it's inextricably linked most often. So think about where else you add value. I certainly truly believe you as a professional are more than the museum or the organisation you work for. So I certainly uh, recommended people become active in forums, active in consultations, because you could still have a professional voice and be on furlough. And for those of you that are still on furlough, this is still an opportunity for you. This concept of standing still was really, really heartfelt. So uh, I had a conversation with somebody today at one of the AMA support group meetings. And, and she said, she said, I've just not done anything, Tamsin. And I was like, well, that's obviously true. We're learning all the time. You don't think that you're learning in the formal sense of the word. So we're all learning. You know, I have learned more about myself professionally and personally through this global pandemic than perhaps I have since uh, I became a parent. So we are all learning but it's about how we think about that learning you know so record it plan more do more some of us like myself were working from home and uh, i was in a really fortunate position is that i'm a, a seasoned professional of working from home but lots of people weren't and the messages that we heard were around lack of connection lack of place uh, people absolutely not being supported by their cheerleaders their their work wives their work husbands their teams their organizations and of course this wasn't just for those people working from home it was also those people that are furloughed so conscious around that the sense of unknown and new things move very quickly and very slowly depending on where you were in the process you sometimes couldn't see what was going to happen you sometimes weren't involved in some of the decisions make decisions that were being made and that all had a contribution in terms of people's sense of self and professionalism so um, thinking about that, that learning is really important. Certainly the concept of uh, working from home creates a, a sense of, of a lack of boundaries. Um, I, I describe currently, sort of, it feels sometimes like my life is quite two dimensional. I'm at work at home and work sneaks into home and home sneaks into work. So we see people doing excess hours. We see people doing seven over five. We or five over seven, that would be in feet. We also see people um, uh, not being able to switch off. You know, so what are the things that you can do? You know, tell your line manager what you need, not what they're prepared to offer. We're all unique. We all have different requirements. Do you know what? We've all been in situations where we haven't known what we were going to do. And we've got it. We've done it. You just need to think about how you employ that, that confidence that you may well have had, that bravado, that courage uh, into those new situations. You know, what helped in the past and what can help you in the future? 
Certainly this concept of boundaries is important. So I create structure. So I have a meeting alert that goes off at four o'clock, you may well hear it, to say that I've finished work. I then have another alarm at five that says get a life. Um, I have different routines, so I go for a walk at six and I also change clothes. This is literally the only outfit you will see me wear when I'm presenting for the Museums Association, apart from a red cardigan. So anything that creates structure between work and home is really, really helpful. And again, all of that is good for, and I know we've talked about it a lot, mental health, but also about our ability to function as a professional in the sector. So for those of you returning to site, I'm in a fortunate position I'm not doing that. I know lots of people would love to be doing it, but it comes with different, uh, different pressures. So the conversations I've been having with people is about this concept of lack of confidence. And that is, you know, a bit of self-doubt if they've been out of the workplace or out of the workspace. Um, the global pandemic certainly hasn't helped with our confidence about how we navigate new things. Um, competence is important. People have had to unlearn things learn new things. They might even have had to learn how to manage a, a new, new manager. Um, some teams are coming back from furlough, but their line managers aren't. So not only are you navigating all those new procedures, you're also having to establish new relationships with a line manager who, who has a duty of care for you. So there's loads of things that people have been, been, been focusing on. And from a collaborative perspective, you know, not only is there new teams, you might be working with new partners, new organisations, but there is certainly, and this comes from both camps, a, a sense of people that were working and are exhausted, and those people that were furloughed and are exhausted. And I think we really need to, to be mindful of the fact that, that no one's experience of this has been wholly positive, and uh, there have been, you know, there been pressures on both. Um, and we certainly shouldn't, as I've heard tell, people come back from being off on furlough and being told by colleagues, oh, I hope you've enjoyed your break. I've worked really hard. You know, it doesn't take a huge amount of emotional intelligence to say that's not appropriate. So a range of opportunities through all our workforce offer, some hints and tips to help you, employ techniques to build your confidence, you know, positive affirmations, visualizations, post-it notes saying are amazing, identify your inner strength, your, your cheerleading team. Um, around all those new procedures, I mean, there is no way you're going to get your head around all of those. So read, read again, check your understanding, when you put it into practice, reflect what worked, what didn't. And I think really this concept of collaboration is that this is all new teamwork. You know, people have been redeployed to different departments, different functions. You are going to have to invest energy. You are going to have to develop rapport and it might take time. So in addition to all of that, you're having to go through different processes. These are all important aspects of your professional practice, which is why I'm talking about them from a professional development perspective. I've got about two or three more things to say. So how do we develop? Lots of the conversations I've had is about the fact that we don't have capacity and that could be about energy, it could be about time, it could be about money. So one of the things I would suggest when you are using this time, perhaps with some professional development reflection, is to reflect on, on what you have. And also um, to think about what inspires you and motivates you. What we know is if you're doing something that you are interested in, if you are learning something new, that has huge positive impacts on your well-being. If you look at the five ways to well-being, it's one of the important points. There is also something about gaps, you know, so what uh, do you need to develop for the job you have? What do you need to develop for the job you want? And also what does the sector need? And there's a separate slide in a moment all about that. From a development perspective, gaining knowledge is fairly straightforward. Reading books, reading articles, journals, watching films, listening to podcasts, all of those things, fairly straightforward. And then once we look at that, we've then got skills development. So who can you observe? Who can mentor you? How can you practice? Experience is more difficult, especially for those of you on furlough or for those of you that are working from home. So is there any way in which you can actually do? Is there any way in which you can volunteer in another organisation to develop your practice, especially if you're on furlough? Is there any way in which you can craft your job to gain more experience or to get feedback that's telling me I should be quiet? Uh, finally, from this particular point is reflection. So record all of this professional development. I have done more in the last six months that I never thought I would do um, and I haven't written it down yet so don't do as I do do as I say record it update your CV put it in your CPD plan put it in a, a way to enable you to consolidate and assimilate your knowledge so final slide for me um, is what can you expect in the future 
So we are wanting to respond to your needs. Please let us know, is there anything we can do that would help? Uh, is there anything we can change that would help you? So what's coming on in the, the second half of this year? So uh, our newly launched website, which I hope you've all been uh, navigating and get some orientation around, will have a dedicated space around redundancy. We are absolutely clear that this is a reality for the sector and we need to speak uh, in, in a, a clear and, and precise way about what that means and how we can help with you. We've already heard about the new Museums Essentials programme that should be with us by the end of the month, which is all about working with community partners. Again, really important in the current situation. How do we engage people that perhaps are not able to be engaged as perhaps they were? And also, how do we share our learning? For those of you that are more HR centred, you will have seen that the government has just introduced the UK-wide kickstart scheme, which is around uh, those individuals between 16 and 24 that are at risk of long-term uh, unemployment. Uh, an article will be coming out on Friday around how the MA can support some conversations about that in the first instance. We're going to put career conversations back on the map, that's from sort of October, November time, and also we can combine the learning from our leadership and essential mentoring programmes and launch a new programme called MA Mentoring for members only. Conference cannot wait, I will see you there. And as ever, remember, we have the Benevolent Fund to support your professional development, to support your signing up to the associateship. And we have more networking events all around, of course, one of our really important strategic aim, which is around championing, championing dynamic collections. And on that note, I'm gonna be quiet, but just to remind you that for those of you that were desperate to see faces, um, uh, we've got this here, so. Come and join me between four and five. See you later. Lovely. Thank you very much, there, uh, Tamsin. Um, could I just, I'll just um, pick up on the point that Jilly made in the chat there about the um, mentoring scheme as well. I was able to take part in um, sort of a number of conversations with people um, through that scheme, and and as I ever found it absolutely fascinating and kind of um, very very worthwhile um, to take, take part in that. Um, so thank you for doing that kind of organising. Um, and so finally today, um, last but not least, we're going to, to move on to our, our, our last speaker who, um, when I was talking with Simon um, at the start of this kind of meeting, um, I, I asked Simon, so how, how, do you, how do you pronounce our speak, last speaker's name? Um, and Simon went a bit embarrassed and said, oh, I don't know, I should, I should probably have kind of asked. So as someone who has a surname who people frequently kind of mispronounce, let me, um, Ask you to introduce yourself rather than me kind of doing myself an embarrassment of, of, of trying to kind of uh, do that. Thank you very much. That's a lovely introduction. Um, my name is Amy Say. Next time I'll make sure I'll put the spelling in brackets next to the name. It's I Nee Say. That's it. <laughs> Hope that helps. Um, thank you for having me. Um, it's a privilege to be here. Um, so just, I, I'll be very quick. I don't have any slideshows. Um, so um, thank you, Tamsin. Very informative. And in fact, that's why I'm here. So uh, it's the AMA, the Associateship of the Museums Associ Association that um, brought me to this meeting. Um, so just to give you a quick um, background information about myself, um, I'm, a <laughs> Hi, <Emma. laughs> I'm a recent history of art uh, graduate, um, I've been volunteering and working in museums for longer than I care to know. Um, I currently work as a museum assistant at the Aberdeen Art Gallery and I understand that had there been no COVID, uh, this meeting would have been held at Aberdeen Art Gallery. So it is a real privilege to serve as a wee link uh, between what is and what could have been. Uh, so we reopened two weeks ago, uh, which has been a daunting slash great experience so far. Uh, just trying to bring together that post lockdown, those insecurities we all carry um, and marrying them with people's eagerness to be back in a museum uh, makes for an interesting combination. It's been a lot of fun. But anyway, so that's a bit of my background. Uh, back to the AMA. Um, so I joined the Museums Association in about 2017, just before when I was finishing my degree. Uh, uh, so I had been thinking about undertaking the AMA probably since then. But deep down, I was um, recovering from academic exhaustion, 
And at the same time, I was trying to gather professional knowledge and experience in the Scottish UK museum sector after living in Australia for 16 years. So it wasn't until now, this year, until lockdown, <laughs> when I finally felt ready and decided to do the AMA. So I was working from home and uh, free of academic pressures now. Um, I had some time to myself. And I think one day I saw a tweet on the Museums Association's Twitter just saying, why not start your AMA now? And I thought, well, why not? So I did. Um, and um, the journey so far has helped me um, direct my thoughts about museums, what they mean to me, what I want them to mean to me. Um, so although what I realized is that although I am a keen and proactive learner, I have been in education long enough to know that without the encouragement of tutors, lecturers, mentors, or some sort of learning program, my learning efforts are wasted. I'm just um, too curious about everything. So I read a lot and retain not much. So the AMA uh, offers me a clear program. Um, it's got excellent candidate support and it provides networking opportunities, which are all things that I really need to get my career going. Um, so communications, for example, during lockdown for the AMA have been fantastic. Tamsin's great. She's been sending us weekly emails, if not more. Um, there's also monthly AMA Q&A sessions for candidates that need to ask anything AMA. Uh, <coughs> we had one just before this meeting, actually. Um, Yes, and uh, relevant issues are raised in these sessions, which allow us to, to talk about what we're feeling, what we're thinking. So all in all, yeah, a lot of support, a lot of learning opportunities. Um, there's also, of course, social media, Facebook, Twitter, um, and other platforms where we can engage as AMAs. So yeah, here I am. Um, I'm very new to all this but I'm very much looking forward to the journey ahead. Um, I am completely aware about the enormous challenges uh, facing the museum sector right now. We are emerging from a global pandemic um, into global <laughs> political instability. Uh, there's Brexit, there's US elections coming and other issues that affect our planet. Um, and on a more personal level, of course, um, seeing friends and family going through furloughs, redundancies, it just hasn't been easy for anyone. But as Maggie mentioned at the beginning, I also remain optimistic and I am aware of the opportunities that these challenges bring. I hope to adapt my learning and my AMA journey to whatever comes my way. And I also hope to remain adaptable, flexible and responsive, as Sarah mentioned as well. Um, and I hope that the AMA helps me face the issues instead of shying away from them. Um, I hope to learn a lot so that I can become a better museum professional and in turn make museums fairer and more inclusive if possible. <laughs> that would be nice. So to sum up, this is me done. If I have to explain the reason of why I decided to undertake the AMA in just one sentence, it would be this to direct my museum learning in a practical, friendly and supportive atmosphere. I hope that this has given some of you an insight into what the AMA is about and how it works. Uh, please contact the AMA, Tamsin, or your local AMA representative for more info. All the details are on the AMA website. And that's it. Thank you very much. Lovely meeting you all and thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you very much, Hanisi. Thank you. That's, that's a lovely way, to, lovely way to round off the afternoon. Um, so I think it really falls to me to kind of just um, wrap up now because we've reached the end of our kind of um, sort of virtual members meeting. Um, thank you to everyone who's kind of um, contributed through the, the chat function and the, and the Q&A. Um, maybe we can kind of carry on um, sort of being this connected with each other. One of the things that I've kind of found quite useful is the sort of um, through lockdown we kind of 
lack of formality around some of the communications that we're now doing kind of through you know, chat functions or just kind of keeping in touch with people. Um, we don't need to kind of convene in this kind of way in order to kind of carry on some of those conversations, share the work that we're doing, ask for information and, and help. And, you know, for the Museum Association, it's so important that we kind of are constantly understanding kind of what you're, um, what, what you're interested in and what you kind of need from us too. Um, if you can do do hang on and kind of join the um, MA Bledders, um, sort of I think Hans has now just reposted the kind of the, the link for for that, um, so the kind of the, the conversation can continue there. Um, just plug a few final kind of things. First of all, um, as I mentioned earlier, the next coronavirus conversation webinar on the 23rd of September, um, dismantling racism in museums. You can sign up for that now on the MA website. Um, the next one after that um, will be on museum ethics um, and you can put that in your diary now of, of October. Um, the Museum Association Conference, um, as Tamsin also mentioned, um, is now an online event free for all members between 2nd and 6th of November. More information on speakers and uh, what the events and uh, panels will be um, to follow shortly. Um, and finally, as I, I kind of mentioned a couple of times before, do let us know what you think of this kind of format um, do let us know kind of um, whether you'd like us to kind of consider doing more of these sorts of events. Obviously, it would be amazing to actually be in Aberdeen, um, but being in Aberdeen might mean that fewer people were able to kind of take part if they had to take a whole day to kind of travel. So do let us know what you think about what the future right kind of mixture between um, different forms of digital meeting up and actually in, in person meeting up um, to would, would kind of be. Um, so, thank you very much again this afternoon, and um, I hope you all kind of um, carry on the conversation and kind of keep in touch with us. Thank you very much.